Hello, my name's Eric Highfield. Uh, I'm a researcher and I run the Greenhouse Technologies program here at Santa Fe Community College in Santa Fe, New Mexico. This is a new program that we started here in the fall. Our college has an emphasis towards sustainable technologies. And really what our greenhouse, our greenhouse management program focuses on is sustainable forms of agriculture that use significantly less water and nutrient inputs than conventional forms of agriculture. So what you see within our 26-foot geodesic dome coming from growing spaces is hydroponic and aquaponic systems that are essentially our, our lab for our, for our program. These are all things that were built by students, including the dome. And this is really the future of food production as I see it. It's the fastest growing form of agriculture on the planet right now. And there's an enormous amount of interest in the field of aquaponics. So what aquaponics is, is an integration of aquaculture and hydroponics in a closed loop symbiotic system. And really what the key link between the fish in aquaculture and the plants in hydroponics is microorganisms. This is an ecosystem that we create. And these microorganisms, specifically uh, nitrifying bacteria, play a pivotal role within these systems. So essentially what we have here is a UVI si style system, which is based on the work of Dr. James Ricosi. He spent 30 years developing a commercial aquaponic system in St. Croix at the University of the Virgin Islands. His system was designed to sit on an eighth of an acre, or 5,400 square feet, and will produce 11,000 pounds of tilapia, in addition to 40,000 heads of produce annually. Um, and this does this with a fraction of the water used in conventional agriculture, because we're able to use the same water over and over and over again. Essentially, the fish process the feed. This is our input to the system. We feed our fish. The fish consume the feed, and then they excrete waste. And then that waste is processed by microorganisms. It converts the ammonium that's present within the fish waste into a form of nitrogen that's much more usable by the, by the plants. It converts the ammonia first to uh, nitrite and then to nitrate. And nitrate is that form of nitrogen which is most easily taken up by these plant varieties. The plants essentially clean the water and allow that water to be reused and recirculated back into the fish tanks. So we use anywhere from 2 to 10% of the water used in conventional agriculture to produce the same amount of crops. So as we walk through these systems, you can see that this is the high point. These fish tanks, these rearing tanks, which again hold Nile tilapia, Oreochromis nihiloticus, um, we have water that's pumped into these tanks. From there, everything else is fed by gravity. So this is the high point. We have water that drains through a venturi valve in the middle of both of these tanks. And we keep these tanks netted because these fish get pretty excited when it comes time to feed. They'll, um, they'll occasionally pull a, a kamikaze mission where they jump out. So we keep nets on top just to keep the fish inside. But essentially the flow of that water then travels over to our mechanical filter. This is a tank that we refer to as a clarifier. It's a settling tank. So this is a cylinder-shaped tank with a vertical baffle that goes down uh, to close to the bottom. And at the bottom of this tank, uh, it's cone-shaped. And we have a line that's plumbed into the bottom. So this allows our settleable solids to settle at the bottom. And then we're able to open a valve and purge the solids from the system. So we'll do this two to three times a day. And the amount of waste that we purge is, is between three to five gallons daily in this system. Um, from there, this water will travel over to the second stage of our filter, to our filter tanks. So any remaining solids will be trapped within these mesh nets, these nylon mesh nets. And the other thing that we have going on in here is we're making use of yet another set of microbial metabolic pathways, denitrification. This system tends to be very nitrogen rich or very nitrogen heavy. That's why leafy greens do so well in aquaponic systems. However, we can grow other plants. We can grow fruiting and flowering plants in these systems. And the way that we'll deal with that, we can manipulate our NPK ratios based on how often we clean these filter nets. So we get denitrifying bacteria that will essentially evolve nitrogen gas from the system. And we can kind of mediate or control those ratios based on how often we clean these nets. So these are the only two tanks within the system that are anaerobic, that are not aerated, because we have very high densities of both fish and plants. So from here, 
the water travels over to what we would call our degassing tank. Um, so we switch from an anaerobic environment back to aerobic. And this tank also functions to distribute the water to our three floating raft plant beds. So you can see that we have, again, aeration. All of the aeration within this greenhouse is supplied by a regenerative air blower, which is on the north face of the greenhouse just outside. And we have air trunk lines that are plumbed underneath our gravel throughout the greenhouse. So from the degassing tank, this nutrient-rich effluent is then distributed to our three floating raft plant beds. These floating raft plant beds are uh, a hydroponic technique known as deep water culture, or specifically continuous flow deep water culture. So we have water that enters each of these tanks here at this spigot valve. Um, that's nutrient rich effluent coming from our degassing tank. And the roots of these plants are just suspended. They dangle into this aerated nutrient solution. There's no soil involved. So the roots of these plants get everything that they need, and it's delivered directly to them. So unlike plants in soil, they don't have to grow enormous root masses and go seeking out the nutrients that they need. Instead, it's being spoon fed. So they can expend their energy growing the aerial portions of the plant, the portions of those plants that we really desire and what we want to harvest. Um, aquaponics and hydroponics are able to, to produce more plants in less space and in less time because we are able to increase the delivery of oxygen to the roots of these plants. We all know that plants will photosynthesize, they take in carbon dioxide through their leaves and stems, and they release oxygen. But one thing that people often don't take into account is that plants respire, just like you and I, where they breathe in oxygen through their roots. Um, and so by adding air to the, the water, by aerating that solution, we are able to increase the amount of oxygen delivered to those plants so we can grow these plants at higher densities and much, much more rapidly than we could in soil. So essentially, those wa the water, the nutrient-rich effluent, enters at one side. It slowly passes across the raft, where it exits on the opposite side through a standpipe. So that standpipe then collects the water. It drains back into our sump tank, where we have our one mechanical pump that moves the water. And that water is then lifted back into our fish tanks. So one other unique thing that we're doing here in, in our Growing Spaces Dome at Santa Fe Community College is that we add heat to our water. Uh, because again, we're growing Nile tilapia. These are warm water fish. They take warm water in order to achieve uh, an optimum FCR or feed conversion ratio. So for them to be able to go from a one gram fingerling to a mature table-sized fish in six months, um, we have to maintain water temperatures above 80 degrees. So the way that we do that, we have a heat exchanger that exchanges heat into the sump of the system. So the water is at its coolest point as it enters the sump, and it's at its warmest point as it enters the fish tanks. And this is the only source of heat that we add to this greenhouse. So even on cold nights here in the summer, our air temperatures haven't dropped below 60 degrees. So where does your heat come from? Well, we, we have a, uh, a water heater, uh, which is again housed in a little shed on the north face of this greenhouse. We have a backup electric element. And we, over the course of the winter, we had a solar thermal panel that was hooked up. So we were able to make use of solar thermal energy to bring that water up to temperature. And then on very cold nights, the electric element would kick in, and it would provide the necessary heat to keep that water above 80 degrees. So uh, that water, as it dis was distributed throughout the various tanks of the system, would then radiate heat to the air and maintain a very warm, comfortable environment within this greenhouse. So this is something that's fairly unique that um, I haven't seen a whole lot of other aquaponic systems doing. Uh, quite often, the standard in greenhouse technology is to use unit air heaters or to heat the air. But air is not the greatest medium for heating. So uh, the thermal mass that we have in our 1,000 gallon system, in addition to the heat that we add from our solar thermal boiler, uh, was more than enough to maintain temperatures. Uh, and you could do this with, for instance, the pond that comes with the Growing Spaces dome. But what we use is a cylinder shaped or a, a circular tank because the corners of those tanks tend to accumulate solids. And again, those solids are very problematic in aquaponic systems. Uh, 
you tend to get anaerobic zones that will accumulate, and those anaerobic zones are really where you tend to accumulate pathogens, um, undesirable microorganisms that can be detrimental to the health of both your fish and your plants. So your question was about our vertical tower systems here. And essentially, the fish tanks and the filtration components do not need light. So we actually want to avoid as much light getting into the fish tanks as possible because that light will cause the growth of algae. And really, we want those nutrients to go to our plants, to be able to grow our plants as opposed to growing algae. So what we've started to do with these vertical towers is create a shade. So we're going to uh, we're going to be continuing these vertical towers on to shade both our fish tanks and our filtration components. Um, we have both a vertical aquaponic tower that we've made, and this is just made out of very simple PVC drain pipe. Again, this is a project we just started at the end of the semester. Um, we have both vertical hydroponics, again using inorganic nutrient solutions, as well as a vertical aquaponic tower. And this is something where a lot of people have taken interest. There's several companies that produce vertical towers, or with a little bit of know-how, you can build one of these things yourself with a $6 heat gun and a saw and a couple pieces of PVC. So you have to have a pump to pump the nutrients up then? Yes, we do. We have a, a submersible pump that pumps the nutrients from our reservoir bucket. It distributes a slow drip through each of these. So we have water that drips through these. And then we have a media that's in place here too. And this is a pretty unique media. This is a product that's local here to New Mexico. It's called Growstone. Um, it's made out of recycled glass. So they take recycled glass out of the landfill, both here in Santa Fe as well as in Albuquerque, and they're able to create this very porous media. So it's very, very lightweight. It looks very much like a stone, but again, it has very good porosity, so we can achieve both delivery of oxygen as well as water and nutrients to the roots of these plants. But uh, what I like so much about the growing stone is that it's made out of 100% recycled materials. A lot of hydroponic medias are in fact not made out of um, recycled or sustainable materials. Uh, these things, they, they essentially will break down. You know, they have very high silicone content, but they are basically pulling glass out of our landfills, out of our recycling centers that would otherwise just sit unused. What I had focused on, you know, solids are very problematic within these systems. So when I was doing my, under, or my graduate research, uh, I did quite a bit of work, work with polyculture with freshwater shrimp. And my, my studies, I was able to conclude that having freshwater shrimp or freshwater prawns that were present, thank you, underneath our floating raft plants was able to improve the health of the system as a whole. So essentially, they were able to work as little biological stirs or biological agitators to be able to consume solids because they're, they're particle feeders and uh, you know, keep things moving as well as consuming those, those particulates. So we were able to dramatically decrease the amount of uh, solids that were present within a floating raft system like this. So tell us about these little uh, tubes there. Oh, sure. So this is, this is how we provide oxygen. This is how we aerate our floating raft system. So all these are is air stones, very much like what you would use in an aquarium or in a hydroponic system. So we're able to provide air to our system using a regenerative air blower, which is housed on the north face of the greenhouse. So we're able to provide all of the dissolved oxygen that we need to our fish, to our plants, as well as to our various hydroponic systems as well. Okay. So does, that, uh, does this provide enough oxygen for the fish, or do you have bubblers as well? We have bubblers in everything except for the, uh, the clarifier and the filter tank. Everything else has to be aerated because we have such a high BOD or biological oxygen demand within the system. Between the plants, the fish, and the microorganisms, they demand a large amount of oxygen. So we supply it with this regenerative air blower. And these are much, much more effective than, for instance, using a conventional aquarium air pump on this scale. You know, those diaphragm air pumps, they tend to fail after a short period of time and uh, these regenerative air blowers were designed for the field of aquaculture. So they, they work very effectively in larger scale systems like this.
So there's a lot of information that you can find out there about aquaponics, but you really have to be able to disseminate the quality of information within there. Um, there's a lot of people that, that I'll refer to as aqua shysters that will you know, tell you all kinds of things about aquaponics that are not necessarily correct. But there is some good, legitimate, free information. Like the publication by Dr. James Ricosi, uh, if, if you were to just do a, a query for SRAC number 454, which stands for the Sud Southern Regional Aquaculture Center, publication number 454, it really gives a good breakdown of commercial aquaponics and the UVI, or the University of Virgin Islands system, which is essentially the aquaponics system that all other large-scale systems have been based around. I'm Dana, I'm the product specialist at Growing Spaces Greenhouses in Pagosa Springs, and we are here with Eric Highfield visiting the Growing Dome at Santa Fe Community College to find out a little bit more about how hydroponics and aquaponics systems work in our greenhouses and to better understand how they work in general. So, Eric just gave us a tour and now I have some questions. <laughs> Um, so the first question, when you're talking about the fish and your input is fish food, yep. um, how do you, so obviously you have Nile tilapia, is that what you Oreochromus nileoticus, yes, okay. Nile tilapia. And so I was reading some of the, uh, about some of the other types of fish you could use. Yes. Um, and so my question is, the fish food itself, how do you select it? Is it the species of fish, does it determine it? Is it the nutrients that you want for the plants that you're growing? Is it a combination of a bunch of, how do you choose your fish food? So the type of fish food is dependent on the species of fish as well as the size of the fish. So while the fish are very small. The adult um, size of the fish, or as they go through as, the As the cycle. fish grow. So as those fish come in at, at finger lengths, we tend to give them a feed that's more of a crumble. It's a smaller feed that's a sinking pellet, and it has a higher protein content. Whereas as those fish become larger, uh, with tilapia, we decrease the protein levels, and then we go to a floating pellet feed which is kind of a standard in aquaculture. So what we're using is a, a pellet with a guaranteed nutritional analysis. Okay. Um, and there are Just a lot like of... a fertilizer, might be. In, in a lot of ways. It's, it's designed to provide the nutritional needs necessary for those fish to achieve optimum growth rates. For um, the fish? Yes. Not for the plants? Correct. Okay. Correct. So those feeds are selected based upon the species of fish. Uh, the protein concentrations, uh, the size of the pellet, whether it's floating or sinking. So that's gonna be species determinant. And then those, as you get a little bit further into it, you know, the size of that fish. So whether it's a small fingerling or whether it's a mature fish, it's gonna alter both the, the shape, the size, and the protein content of that pellet feed. There are other possibilities for feeds. There's a lot of people who will use things like insect protein, duckweed, um, but again, very much like people, fish have to have a variety of inputs. You know, you can't just feed a fish duckweed. There's actually growth inhibitors that are found within duckweed. So it can be a good supplemental feed, but it cannot be the sole source of nutrition for these fish if you want them to achieve good growth rates. You know, tilapia are desirable in these systems because they are so efficient at converting a feed into biomass. Their FCR, or feed conversion ratio, is extremely efficient. So for every pound of biomass that the fish put on, they consume between one and two pounds of fish, or one and two pounds of feed. And that's not very much food for how much they're... If you were to compare that to a terrestrial animal, I mean, it's, it's significantly less. A cow is gonna be closer to <laughs> an FCR of, of 10 to 12. Okay. Um, so I'm going to flip flop all the way to the other end since we're talking about fish. No and I'm problem. I'm curious about, um, about harvesting fish. When sure. you, I mean, obviously, I read all about having a market for it, and I guess if you were a small growing dome owner, your market just might be your family. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you know when the fish are ready to harvest, and how do you go about harvesting them, and how do you know that they're safe to eat? Well, um, unless you're eating these as sushi, if you're eating them raw, that's something that, you know, that's going to bring out a whole other set of issues, just like when you're, you're eating sushi at a restaurant. You know, it can be a little bit dangerous in that respect because you have a potential for, you know, uh, certain, certain microorganisms or even parasites to be found within fish. But people typically cook tilapia. 
um, and the fish that they eat at home for the most part. So there really isn't a safety concern if you cook the fish. Um, with that being said, there are a few things that you really want to look out for. Um, tilapia, as well as other fish species, will essentially get a, uh, an off flavor from consuming bacteria as well as algae. So there's compounds like geosamine that will result in these off flavors. So what a standard practice is in aquaculture is to purge those fish. So essentially what you will do is you will, you will scoop them and take them out of their tank within the system, put them into a tank of clean water, um, eliminate sunlight, and not feed them for about a week. So this allows them to kind of uh, to cleanse their system. So any of that algae and those off-flavor compounds that they've consumed can be purged from their system. And at that point, they are clean and safe to eat. And this is a standard practice in aquaculture. And are you harvesting fish here from this system? And yes. So you have something like that somewhere? Yeah, we will. Um, again, this is a new program. This okay. is a new system. Our first harvest of fish will be ha happening at the end of the summer in August. And How essentially, quickly do they grow? I go from a one gram fingerling to a 1,000 gram table fish in six months. So it grows very, very quickly. Let's see. What else do I have here? Oh, um, when I was reading that wonderful document, I read a little bit about um, fingerlings in the clarifier. Yes. Can you talk about, is that something that you have yes, it is. In here? And, um, talk a little bit more about why that's been. I would be happy to talk about this. This is one of the clever innovations that Dr. Ricosi came up with while developing the system over 30 years. You know, he, tend, he tended to follow the KISS principle. He wants to keep things as simple as possible because when you're dealing with a fairly complex system with multiple components, really you want to avoid problems wherever possible. So that's why our mechanical filter, our clarifier, is such a simple unit without moving parts. And what Dr. Ricosi found is that, you know, because this is a living biological system, you're gonna get biofilms, uh, things like algae, various microorganisms that accumulate within the pipes that plumb these systems together. Um, so those things can eventually lead to those pipes becoming so constricted that you lose water flow and you would, you would essentially have a leak or a spill. Um, so what he found is stocking small fingerlings into the clarifier tank not only helped those solids settle out at the bottom of the, the settling tank at the bottom of the cone, but they're also able to swim back through our large oversized pipes. And what they do is uh, tilapia typically are, are omnivorous, but in nature they consume a lot of detritus and biofilms. So what they do is they, they swim back through these distribution pipes and they just consume the, the biofilms that accumulate within the pipe. So they help to keep those things clean, uh, which is another step that saves people time and, and effort when doing this on a larger scale. And so um, when they do swim back in here, they don't get back into these? That is correct. And you just have like a, like a screen or like a... Well, what I... you prevent them from getting in here and from getting in your wrap system? So we have several things in, in place, and that's a great question, because if you have fish that get underneath your floating raft plants, it's extremely detrimental. Those the, the fish will consume the roots of the plants. Um, they'll, they'll destroy them in a very short period of time. So there's several things that we do to try and avoid that. Uh, what I'm doing is using all male fish in these tanks. So I have all male fish, meaning that I cannot have breeding. Uh, tilapia are prolific, their ability to breed. Is there a difference between having all male and all female fish? Like, is there a reason yes. you would have chosen males instead of all fish? They grow faster and they grow larger. So that's kind of the standard. Um, and aquaculture has been rearing tilapia for quite some time, and they've come up with some really innovative and effective strategies to produce all male fish. Um, and the other thing that we're doing, so uh, if you do have mixed sex populations, which is something that a lot of people do, um, just having multiple lines of defense, essentially screening at different levels to prevent those fish from getting ultimately underneath your floating raft plant beds. Uh, when I ran the research greenhouse at the University of Arizona, I did have mixed sex populations. I did have breeding that occurred within my tanks. 
And sure enough, I had a small little tilapia fingerling that slipped through into the pipe. And it actually lived its entire life within this large four inch pipe until it grew so large that it clogged the pipe. And I, I ended up coming in and I had a huge spill. So I had to go through, shut the system down, pop that pipe open, and this fish comes flopping out. He was still alive. He had just grown so large that he had clogged that four inch diameter PVC. So there's several things that we can do. And what, what I use is something known as a venturi drain, where we have a standpipe that regulates the height of the water. And then I have an outer piece of PVC that sits around the outside that allows us to pull solids from the bottom of the tank. And it also prevent, prevents pelletized feed from going down the system over into our, our filtration components. So there are several mechanisms that you put into place to keep those tilapia from where going down. This pipe, the one in the center, where is it draining? So this then goes underneath the tanks and comes into the side of the clarifier here. And then again, I have small fingerlings that live within this clarifier. So I have about five or six fish within here and they swim back through this pipe. They are able to eat those biofilms, but they are not able to get back up this pipe because again, we don't have a steady flow of water. You know, fish can't swim upward three feet through air. Okay. Um, so let's see, if we're talking about the clarifier, um, you were talking about denitrification. Yes. And um, how you can use that process to control based on the plants that you're growing um, production, basically. Mm -hmm. So with, a, with a, a fruiting vegetable, you want less nitrogen, so it puts on less vegetative growth. Yes. And then it fruits, whereas if you're growing a lettuce or something, more, more nitrogen will just help it grow. Nitrogen larger. feeders, correct. So um, I, if you could talk a little bit more about that, that would be great. And then I also wanted to ask another question about solids in terms of mineralization. Sure. So. Uh, one thing with aquaponics is you essentially have a group of nutrients that are provided from the effluent from those fish. And I found that the best way of dealing with that, you can't necessarily make huge changes. You can reduce the amount of nitrogen, but you can't substantially increase, for instance, your, your phosphates. Um, you can increase your potassium a little bit when you balance your pH, but more or less you're given a, a set group of nutrients and you base your plant selection on that. You can grow lots and lots of different plant varieties within an aquaponic system, including fruiting or flowering plants, but leafy green plants are what tend to do the best within these systems. So and they're also probably the most economic. The most economically viable. They're certainly the most productive. I can take a a seedling of lettuce or bok choy and I can grow that to a mature size in less than 30 days. So I can grow those leafy green or those high nitrogen feeders extremely quickly. Whereas if I were to grow a tomato plant in here, um, my tomato plants are not going to be able to achieve the same growth that I could compared to a hydroponic tomato where I'm delivering synthetic nutrients to that based upon its needs. So you kind of need to base your plant selection upon the nutrients that are present. And this tends to, again, be a very nitrogen heavy system. So that's why I tend to grow leafy green vegetables. They're what do the best, they, grew, they grow the most quickly, and we're able to achieve the, the best growth with that, that type of plant. If you, so these are tilapia, but if you were to use a different type of fish, mm -hmm. would your nutrients be different or is it, or is it the same? Yeah, so your nutrients are going to change based upon the fish. Um, and it's not so much because of the species, but it has to do with the amount of feed that goes in. So this system is designed based upon inputs versus growing space. So you have a set amount of fish feed that goes into this that's based on the square area and of your plant growing space. Density? Or how is the stocking the density? The stocking density is just relevant to the amount of feed that goes in. And that's something that Dr. Ricosi figured out over a 30 year period. Essentially it's 60 to 100 grams of feed per square meter of growing space per day. And that's really the ratio that you want to keep in mind. So if you're going to be feeding 60 to 100 grams of feed per square meter of growing space per day, for instance, if you're growing a different fish variety that you can't grow at as high of a density as tilapia, you're going to be looking at much larger tanks as far as your fish tanks. But with tilapia, we're able to grow very high densities of fish. So tilapia are sort of the industry standard in aquaponics 
because they are so tolerant to a variety of conditions. Um, they're tolerant to, uh, to fluctuations in pH, in water quality. Um, they can tolerate fairly low dissolved oxygen concentrations. They tolerate large variations in salinity. But an interesting thing with tilapia, you know, they're, um, they're cichlids, they're African cichlids. And when they're grown at low densities, when you have them growing with just a few fish in a tank, they actually can become very aggressive and territorial. Whereas they exhibit this natural tendency when grown at high densities, they school and they become very docile and non-aggressive towards each other. Um, so, I know that we were talking about filtering out solids, both in your, you know, in the clarifier and then using those, what was it, is it just netting? A filter tank and it's nylon netting, nylon essentially. Netting. So, um, in terms of trace mineral, like mineralization in these beds, or in your RAF system, um, I was reading and maybe I misunderstood that, that like a small amount of solids is an okay thing in there because they get mineralized and then they provide, you know, and then those things are available for the plants. But I guess my question is, like, where do you draw the line, you know? Well, they're really, it, the, the way that I draw the line, I want to remove as many solids as I possibly can from the system. But there's no way you're going to get 100%. No, you're not going to get 100%. So eventually you are going to have solids that accumulate underneath your floating raft beds. And there's some novel ways that you can deal with those. Uh, having certain fish varieties, things like guppies or uh, red ear sunfish or things that they did in the Virgin Islands. I was able to find through my graduate studies that using freshwater shrimp was very effective at keeping uh, solid levels down underneath your floating wrap beds. But the mineralization that you're speaking of is taking place at the various other components in the system. So it's taking place within the fish tanks, it's taking place within the clarifier, it's also taking place within the filter tank as well. Um, and that mineralization, there are a few micronutrients, depending on where your source water is coming from and the, and the analysis of that source water that need to be added. Uh, again, the key link between the aquaculture and the hydroponics is nitrifying microorganisms. But those nitrifying microbes, when converting ammonium to nitrate, they produce acid. So as time goes on, the system, the pH becomes lower and lower. So what we'll typically do is we will add base to the system to maintain that pH close to neutral. At what point in the system do you add the base and what types of are we so I'm adding base as we speak right now. So this is what we would call a base addition tank. And this is just a tank that's set on a very slow drip. I'm adding it to the sump tank of the system. And right now I'm adding potassium hydroxide. And I want to add that till I get somewhere close to neutral. The optimum pH range for an aquaponics system is essentially between 6.5 and 7.2. Um, once you stray too far beyond that, it becomes undesirable for either the fish or the microbes, or if you get too extreme for the fish themselves. Again, the tilapia are fairly versatile. They can tolerate the variations. Do fish prefer higher, like more basic environments? You know, in general, in general what's the, compromise there? The, the compromise is really between the microorganisms and the plants. Okay. The plants prefer a slightly lower pH, uh -huh. whereas those microorganisms tend to prefer um, a more alkaline pH. So the other thing that we do add to the system is a little bit of iron. It's been shown that iron becomes deficient in these systems over time. So we just add a little bit of chelated iron and we add that about every two weeks. Um, and that way we're able to prevent chlorosis or other nutrient deficiencies based upon uh, nitrogen, or excuse me, iron levels. Okay. Um, so you pulled out one of the rafts and you've got this huge root mass. Um, what do you do with the roots when you harvest the plant? I compost them. I compost them. There's other things that you can use. You can use stackable uh, worm beds for vermiculture. And you can actually take the roots, as well as any other part of the plant that you're not going to consume or eat, along with the aerated sludge waste from the fish. And you can use this as a substrate with um, some shredded cardboard or paper to grow worms in vermiculture. And then you can actually use those worms as a supplemental feed within your system. Or truthfully, those red wiggler composting worms are rather valuable in their own respect. So this gives you another added value product if you're looking to sell these products. Um, it doesn't sound like you have it going on in here, but I was reading about the nutrient film technique. NFT is actually what you see that with our, is this is our hydroponic system. 
And this can be used in conjunction with aquaponics. Ours right now is using uh, essentially inorganic nutrients. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll go through chemical calculations based on the specific needs of our plants. But what we have going here is a constant stream of water and nutrients that passes along the roots of these plants. So that way these roots get access to all of the water, the nutrients, but also oxygen. Oxygen is again what allows plants being grown hydroponically or aquaponically to grow more rapidly than plants in soil because we can increase the amount of oxygen delivered to the roots of these plants. Um. And so this is, this is an NFT. This is, and again, it stands for Nutrient Film Technique. Um, and so I know we just talked about it a little bit in terms of um, when you are, the nitrification process basically makes the, um, um, it makes the water more acidic because of the hydrogen. Problems. Yes. Um, and so you're adding a basic solution. So are there any other adjustments that you have to make as the system works? consistently. It sounds like at the beginning it takes a little while for it to kind of normalize. It but does. after that, after you've got it going, um, other than a kind of maintaining the pH. pH and adding iron, um, it actually becomes much easier to manage as the system becomes established. Okay. Sometimes aquaponics is referred to as lazy man's hydroponics because truthfully there's much less monitoring that needs to take place as opposed to a, a commercial hydroponic system where you're really looking at in detail at water analysis. Um, in an aquaponic system you become comfortable, you see what the nutrient levels are based upon the growth of your plants. Um, and unless you experience a problem, it doesn't require a whole lot of monitoring. Um, for the purposes of in here, do you monitor these systems? Because it's kind of more of a the, laboratory? The or pH. Okay. I look at pH. I also do occasionally look at EC. Mm -hmm. um, but really pH and temperature are the two biggest parameters and dissolved oxygen as well. Um, you can tell if there's oxygen present within the water based on the behavior of the fish, but also just if, you're, if your bubblers are working. Um, so you can use a dissolved oxygen meter, but truthfully, just maintaining an eye on the pH is, is the most important thing. When you're establishing a system, you have to look at your nitrogen content, both ammonium, nitrite, and nitrate. To see if those bacteria are... Yeah, to make sure you get established, just like when you start an aquarium and you cycle it. Um, so in terms of nutrients for plants, obviously certain plants have certain nutrient requirements and we discussed nitrogen, but um, is there, a, and obviously the water that you're using has certain, you know, micronutrients in it, so I bet the answer to my question is it depends, but... Um, <laughs> it's one of my favorite there, answers. Yeah, is there a typical limiting nutrient in these types of systems that you're often looking for? Or Again, iron is something that we know needs to be supplemented. So we'll use chelated iron. They do have organic certified iron supplements. That's so it doesn't fall out of solution? Correct. It, it makes it so it, it's available. It's in a form that's available to the plants. That chelated iron is something that goes into solution as opposed to uh, forming precipitates and falling out. So that's something that has been shown necessary in almost all aquaponic systems. Um, they found based so upon that's another input other than the food. A little bit of chelated iron every two weeks. Okay. Um, a question that I get all the time about our greenhouses, and I'm sure it applies in this system too, is what about um, pests? So, I mean, the door's open. I'm sure an aphid could make its way in here. And we do. What do you do about, um, you know, and especially because I was reading that pesticides and even um, you know, the treatment, and I'll ask that as well about the treatment of fish. What if you get a sick fish? Um, you know, let's do the plant part first. Sure. So if you have an aphid infestation, I was reading, you know, insecticides, not really a good idea. Yeah, you're very, you're very limited. In, so what do you do about your, it? Your integrated pest management is very limited in aquaponics. You can't use conventional pesticides in these systems. So what we'll use is various biological forms of control. Um, I've been using a product called Mycotrol or Botanigard uh, WP22, which is a fungal means of controlling soft-bodied insects, but it's safe for people, pets, and fish. 
Uh, and this is a way of kind of non-selectively knocking back soft-bodied insects. But other things include beneficial insects. Uh, so using things like uh, parasitic or predators for those aphids. And is this an appropriate environment for beneficial insects? Like, can they breed well, and do they? Do they, they they can. And this space right here. So this is this is a common practice in commercial greenhouse technologies is to use beneficial insects to control pests. Um, and in this space, you know, the the amount that you purchase for a uh, a beneficial insect population tends to be rather high for this kind of space. You know, this is a fairly small greenhouse in in a lot of respects. So you need to have somewhere else to be able to distribute some of those, uh, those predators or parasitic insects. Um, being able to use something as simple as ladybugs or being able to put attractants in here to bring ladybugs into your greenhouse. This is a possibility. You know, I've seen people that have used things like praying mantis, but truthfully, uh, using things like predatory mites or parasitic wasps work very, very well against insect pests. Um, but pests are a problem. And the more species you have, so not just the fish um, and the plants, but also the microorganisms, you have to be very, very selective. You can't typically use some of the other forms of uh, pest control that you would be able to use uh, in, in soil. So things like ins insecticide soaps or, um, or oils, things like neems. They can are harm the microorganisms. The fish, actually. The fish. So having soap or oil present in your solution, in your water, is not desirable for your fish. So you are very limited, but that doesn't mean that you can't deal with those things. So the majority, what you're saying, the majority of pest control in here is biological. You're not doing... It's all anything. biological. It's all biological. You're not doing mechanical, cultural, or mechanical control at all. Okay. So the fish, if, like what if a fish gets sick? I don't know how that would happen, but... Um, there are diseases. There are diseases that, you know, fish could in fact become infected with. And fortunately for us, tilapia are fairly resistant. Not to say that they're immune, but a standard practice in aquaculture would be to remove or isolate those fish. And I, I really don't use antibiotics. I think that that's something that should be avoided. But truthfully, to be able to isolate a sick fish and put them in an isolation tank with a higher salt content is something that often helps with uh, various skin sicknesses or parasites, which tend to be the most prominent diseases that, that you'll experience with fish. And then if you did that, could you then return that fish into the system? And yes. That would be fine? Yes. The one thing that you have to avoid uh, in aquaculture systems, if you are not growing plants aquaponically, uh, they'll often just add salt to the system. And that's something that can kind of help combat disease within those fish populations. But in here, I obviously can't just add salt because I have plants growing. That's not going to be desirable for the growth of my plants. So I'll remove that fish. I'll put it in an isolation tank with a, a higher salt concentration. And once that fish is, is healed, you simply scoop him out of that isolation tank and return him to the system. I, I just did this recently with some goldfish inside. We put him into an isolation tank for a week and a half. Um, the disease cleared up, the skin problem deal cleared up, and we returned them back into our tank. So you have, in terms of nutrient cycling, it's pretty consistent, like this yes. in general. So that's why you're wanting to select plants that require the nutrients mm -hmm. that are already in here, and you're not trying to bend over backwards to produce a cucumber that, you know, requires different levels of nitrogen throughout its life cycle. Yes, that is correct. And, and not to say that you couldn't produce that cucumber, but I could produce that cucumber much more effectively, either hydroponically uh -huh. or in soil. Or in soil. Okay. So, you know, I, I base my plant selection on this. If this is something that you're doing as a hobby scale, there's people that certainly grow tomatoes and cucumbers, but... In terms of efficiencies, like if you're, if this is a commercial operation on a commercial scale or a scaled down commercial scale, you're not really wanting to grow. That's correct. I mean, all of the plants in the system are less than a month old. Okay. So these plants grow very, very quickly. Um, and you do, you base your selection as far as your nutrient cycling and your nutrient dynamics. I think that it's best when you have a set group of nutrients to base your plant selection on what you have present rather than try to complicate it or to reduce the production of something like a fruiting or a flowering crop. Um, so it seemed very, when I started reading that article, it seemed to me very that aquaponics was originally came into being and correct me if I'm wrong, because people were wanting to produce 
fish as the primary product, and then to utilize utilize and then plants as a secondary product correct however now as as it develops it seems like i was just recently at chimney rock farms and their primary objective is to produce plants not fish so when you are when you're defining your primary objective and your primary product how does that um, change your way of thinking or your planning like if i was if i was determined to grow tomatoes in my aquaponics system what how would that, how would my planning be different? Or if my goal was to, you know, to produce high amounts of basil for pesto and I didn't care too much about selling the, the fish or utilizing, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, so, and that's, that's one thing that people will often ask, you know, uh, when they're first setting up a system, what is your goal? Do you really want to produce plants? Do you really want to produce fish? And you can kind of build and design a system around what it is that you're most interested in producing. Um, you know, ironically enough, in this system, the UVI style system, uh, the plants tend to be worth significantly more money than what the fish are, mm -hmm. which is kind of ironic considering that the, the plant growing system was developed as a means of treating effluent in aquaculture. Mm -hmm. But if you were to look at the production capabilities of a full-scale version of the system, say growing basil in the Virgin Islands. So if we had a full-scale version of the system, which is again going to take up about 5,400 square feet, um, I would be able to produce, say, 11,000 pounds of fish and then 11,000 pounds of basil. Well, that 11,000 pounds of basil it's is going to be worth a lot more money. If you figure that you're selling that, that retail for, say, $8 a pound, which is not a, outrageous when it comes to basil, um, that's $88,000. As opposed to those tilapia selling for maybe $1.99 a pound, you're looking at $22,000 in that case. So it has kind of been proven that, at least with tilapia, you're looking at the plants being worth a lot more money. And you certainly could use one of these systems without ever harvesting the fish. You could just allow those fish to keep eating and processing feed and excreting waste and just use them as a nutrient source for your plants. Okay. And you could do that with fish that are also non-edible. You could do things with koi carp or goldfish. I have a lot of customers, Growing Spaces customers and prospective customers, calling me and asking me about aquaponic systems and so I'm wondering in your experience um, you know why is this advantageous and how can it be advantageous in in this growing dome structure compared to another growing system well uh, the advantages of aquaponics uh, there, there's several but the most prevalent is consumption of water we're able to produce more plants in less space, we can do this more quickly than we could in soil, and we do this with a fraction of the water that we would use to grow the same amount of plants in soil. So people that live in a really arid environment that don't have access to a lot of water might be interested in this. Absolutely, system. absolutely. Um, and the other thing too is, you know, in aquaponics and in hydroponic systems, again, it's delivery of oxygen to the roots of the plants that allow us to grow plants more quickly and larger than plants being grown in soil. So we're able to increase the amount of oxygen delivered to the roots of plants in hydroponic systems up to 80% compared to plants being grown in soil. Um, when you look at other hydroponic techniques such as aeroponics, that, that amount can go all the way up to 99% as far as the increase in oxygen delivered to the roots of those plants. So we can grow and more... it's easier for you to control that oxygen flow. Yes. As opposed to in soil. We can grow more plants in less space. We can grow them uh, more quickly and we can do it with a fraction of the water. Uh, the other nice thing too is that you avoid problems like having to weed, for instance. I've never once had to have weed, uh, a weeding session within this, this dome because quite frankly, there's no way for weeds to be introduced. Or cleaning a bunch of dirt off of your lettuce. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we still rinse our, our produce off before we, we consume it. Um, and the majority of our food here goes directly over to our culinary department with the exception of a little bit of basil that I take home and some lettuce for some occasional salads. But it makes it very, very simple. You know, for us, planting these systems too. We'll just start a seedling off in one of these little, uh, this is something that's sold under the commercial name of a rapid rooter. So we'll start a seedling, we'll add it to our net pot, and we add it to our raft. And essentially, we're done. We've already planted. So it takes a lot of the work out. It, it eliminates a lot of the labor as far as planting, as well as harvesting too. Um, so obviously here at Santa Fe Community College, this is more of a laboratory setting. 
so um, for a growing dome owner that was interested in having a more aesthetically pleasing space, not that this isn't beautiful, um, you know, do you have any recommendations or ideas about how, you know, how the inside could be more aesthetically pleasing? Absolutely, and I think that that's one of the, the aspects that makes the growing domes from growing spaces so appealing is that they can provide essentially a sanctuary space. And not to say that this isn't my sanctuary away from the classroom, but you can certainly set these things up in a matter where you can have more space to be able to move around, where it's, it's more aesthetically pleasing. You have more zen to your setup. Um, in here, we've tried to put as many systems as possible within this little 550 square foot space. And you can see we're able to produce a lot of plants within it. However, if, if this was something that people were being, uh, doing in their own space in their backyard for their own personal consumption, I think that there's a lot of layouts that could be done to make this much more aesthetically appealing. I think that doing things like, for instance, housing some of these, these high density polyethylene tanks within wood to make them look a little bit better, or even just having wood or, for instance, brick structures with pond liners is another possibility. I've always liked the concept of having beds around the south uh, east and west faces of the greenhouse. And then again, I, I like the premise of keeping the fish tanks on the north face. You know, again, you don't need light that penetrates through to those fish tanks. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you could make this aesthetically appealing. And that wasn't my primary concern with this dome. You know, this is a learning lab. This is our space where we teach people how these different techniques work. We teach people about the ecology of these systems, about the microbiology, about the chemistry of making nutrient solutions. You know, uh, we really do cover a broad variety of, of STEM technologies or STEM uh, programs within these systems. And quite often, you know, you can kind of trick people into becoming very interested in hard sciences without them even realizing it. You know, and a question. So what you're saying is that if you're using a bed with like a plastic liner, mm -hmm. you could possibly do a perimeter bed of whatever width and line it with plastic and have the rafts in the perimeter bed? Absolutely. You could have that an idea. You mm -hmm. could have rafts within a perimeter okay. bed. Or if you wanted to go with the simpler, like a hobby scale system, you could again have plastic line beds around the perimeter mm -hmm. filled with something like gravel or an expanded clay pellet, some sort of media, and have a smaller, simpler hobby scale system. And then maybe have some raised plant beds in the middle as well as some tables and chairs or a hammock is something I've always envisioned that would go well within these domes. And what about the fish tanks themselves? Um, you know, for some of the domes, they do have a circular tank, and I know you expressed concern about the oval tank having corners. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible, in terms of uh, dealing with the sediment, to use the kind of tank that? Uh, the growing spaces domes usually have? Yes, yes that it would. would. Even the standard oval-shaped tank, mm -hmm. the, the pond that comes standard on several of the growing domes, could be used as a, a fish tank. But again, you're just not going to be growing fish at the same density as what I have going in this system. And, and how would you deal with the sludge, the fish, fish poop, or unused food on the floor of the tank? What would you... So, methodology be for that? Again, using a, a drain, uh, something that I call a venturi where essentially you have a center standpipe that regulates the height of the water. You have water that flows into that tank, and then around the outside of that standpipe, you put a larger piece of PVC that has notches cut into the bottom of it. So this allows you to essentially remove solids from the bottom of that tank, suck them through the system so they don't stay in the bottom where they can potentially cause problems uh, creating anaerobic zones, harboring pathogens. Okay. I'd be happy to show you the way that our venturi drains work. Okay. Where yeah, that's a lot of people are asking that. Can I use my tank? But uh, you, we can figure out how to do that. We oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I, I'd be happy to show you how this thing works. Um, and this is a common practice in aquaculture. And it's a great way of, again, preventing that floating feed from going through your system. And then also keeping fish from, from going down the, the tube. And then lastly, removing the solids from the bottom of the tank. And this can be done uh, with a growing spaces, uh, essentially the, the pond with the liner and the, the metal tank. Um, or you can do it with a, an HDPE tank, much like what we have. And then in terms of, uh, what about energy usage? Um, are there any figures or uh, for someone to 
figure out how much, say, the pumps and the aerators would be using? You can, you can very simply hook up a kilowatt meter to mm -hmm. your, okay. your electrical pumps. Mm -hmm. and, and truthfully, the air pump and the water pumps don't consume an incredible amount of energy. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. maybe $1 to $200 a year at the very most. Okay. Um, the, the biggest energy consumption that's used within these domes or within an, uh, a greenhouse is typically energy used for heating and cooling. Okay. And we're looking at some pretty novel things. We're actually going to be installing a heat pump unit within this greenhouse that will be able to function both to heat mm -hmm. and to cool, but we're also going to be able to condense water out of the air to make even more efficient use of our water. Could your pumps be, um, like the air and the water pumps, could they be hooked up to a solar panel? They could, but you would need to have a battery system or you would need uh, a pump that could be run off of both AC and DC. Because unfortunately here, you know, the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day. So you need a battery storage system to keep those pumps running. Again, that air pump needs to run 24 hours a day, 365 days a year when growing fish at this kind of density. So you could, if you had a, uh, the right amount of solar panels and battery storage, absolutely, you could, you could run it off the of solar. You could be completely off grid with one of these systems. It's just uh, you know the energy systems are what are going to be the the largest capital investment if you wanted to go off grid. Okay, but you were saying over the winter that the shape of the dome and the the five wall glazing made it very energy efficient. In oh, absolutely. To compare it to a conventional greenhouse with the glazing, I mean, the U value on this is approximately 0.33, which is much, much more efficient than, than other glazings that are available on the market. And again, you know, you get at least 10 years worth of use out of this glazing material. I've been very, very pleased with it. And, you know, truthfully, the amount of energy that's gone into just heating our water, which is responsible for heating our air, has been fairly inconsequential compared to what would go on in a conventional greenhouse. That's great. So there are a lot of pluses of having having the dome. Oh, that, absolutely. Space to have this, and then it would be optimizing the use of the space according to the person, the owner's personal taste. But you know, the option of of, of towers and that kind of mm -hmm. thing uh, helps use some of the vertical space if absolutely the wanted to do that or even in some of the larger dome facilities mm -hmm. and it's something that i'd even pondered for here mm -hmm. was essentially adding a second level that goes over the top of the fish tanks and filtration components yes. to be able to add a loft space mm -hmm. to either increase yes. the the area for growing plants okay. or to add some more sanctuary space you know a nice little loft with a with a hammock or a, a cot where you could go up and take a nice afternoon nap Great. So essentially, you designed an uh, aquaponic system for a 42-foot dome, I remember. In yes, sir. Pagosa. But you, so you could essentially design systems if people wanted that for different size of domes? By all means. That's great. By all means. So and, be a great resource. and it's just based upon, you know, the, the needs of each individual person. Everybody's going to have different needs. Some people want to produce fish. Other people just want to produce plants. People that are vegetarians could certainly run this system just using koi or mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. goldfish if they wanted to. Uh, you could run it with tilapia and just simply never harvest them. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of different ways that you can add to the aesthetics. You can add windows to the tank so you can see the fish swimming around. Um, you know, the, the possibilities are really endless. You know, this technology um, has only been applied, you know, on a large scale within the last 20 or 30 years. But truthfully, people have been growing fish and plants in conjunction for hundreds if not thousands of years. Yeah. If you look at what the Aztecs did around Tenochtitlan, they're chimpanayas. They're essentially floating raft beds where the roots of the plants would eventually dangle down into the, into the lake where there were absolutely fish present. Um, if you look at things like fish in rice paddies. This is something that's still a common practice. Mm -hmm. It's been hypothesized that the hanging gardens of Babylon were actually aquaponic gardens. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah, well, I'm sure this will be very helpful for a lot of our potential customers. We get questions over and over again about aquaponics. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you for all your wonderful information. It was my pleasure, Scott. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, we look forward to being able to give some of our customers really authoritative, accurate, comprehensive information that will help them decide whether to do aquaponics system. And if they do decide to help them move forward in the best way possible. So thanks for doing that. You're very welcome. So this is a micro scale aquaponics system. Um, this is something that would be done on a hobby scale. You could put this in front of a window in your home 
And essentially what this is, is an aquarium where the water would never need to be changed. You can see it's a little murky right now. Normally our water is nice and clear, but our filter bag needs to be changed out. But essentially we have goldfish, we have a couple of costumes, and again, it functions very much like the other systems where we add our, our input of nutrients in the form of a pelletized feed. The fish then consume that, those pellets, they metabolize those nutrients and excrete waste, and then that water, that nutrient-rich water, passes from the standpipe by gravity over to this first media bed. This media bed contains an expanded clay pellet, and this is just an inert media that's a placeholder uh, that's often used as a planting bed in hydroponic or aquaponic systems. But what I have going in here is red wiggler composting worms. And so I have those in conjunction with a bell siphon or an auto siphon that allows that water level to both fill and drain and fill and drain on its own without any moving parts. So those red wiggler composting worms are able to consume and mineralize the solid waste from those fish and essentially to, um, to further break down at beneficial microbes as well as trapping some of those solids that are problematic. So that nutrient-rich effluent passes through these two media bed filters down into a sump tank where I have my submersible pump. And from there, that water is then pumped up to my NFT. So this is my hydroponic subsystem in this. Um, the roots of the plants just dangle constantly into these troughs where they're exposed to both water, nutrients, and you can see we have a couple of the worms that have made their way through. The worms are also very persistent. They'll make their way through the system. But uh, the roots of these plants, you can see, are very healthy. They basically get all of the water, nutrients, and oxygen that they need. And then these plants are, in fact, a biofilter. They are removing the nutrients from that water so that water can be recirculated back into the fish tank. Um, this is a lower density system. We're not growing nearly the, the density of fish or plants. Um, but this is, this is a system that I had designed a few years ago. It's, a, it's fairly rudimentary in a lot of ways, and there's room for improvement, but uh, it, it's worked very well. I've had the system running for several years.